Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar um, organized by uh, Planetera and also by Winta. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here today. The, um, the objective of this webinar is to commemorate uh, the International World, the, the National Day of the Indigenous People. Um, it, today we have some panelists and we'll have a panel. Um, so let's let's get started. We have for this webinar an interpreter and she will be translating everything to your language. Um, so the way in which you can activate the interpretation is down here below, there's a, um, a sign like a little world sign and there you can activate the interpretation to the language of your choice. Aquí abajo pueden activar el, la interpretación. En un icono que es como un mundito, pueden activar el idioma que ustedes necesiten. Okay, instructions. There's instructions here in the screen of how to activate your simultaneous interpretation. I hope everyone has found the interpretation symbol. Um, and there's also here down below a place where you can put your questions. There's Q and A. Um, the chat is not active, but there's Q and A where you can put all your um, questions when, when you have them. And at the end, there's gonna be a moment when where we're going to through those go through those questions. Okay. Bueno, the agenda looks like this. We're going to talk a little bit about Planetera, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Global Community Tourism Network, uh, which is a project that Planetera is promoting, and then we're going to um, introduce our our este, organization that is that is working with us in this webinar, the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance or, Alliance or WINTA. And then you're gonna be able to meet all the panelists and moderator of this panel. We're gonna have a panel discussion and at the end, there's gonna be a room for questions and answers. And that's where um, it's, that's when it's valuable that you're writing over your questions um, and, and we're going to go through them at the end of this webinar. Okay, so who is Planetera? Planetera is a nonprofit organization um, bueno, based in, in, in Canada, uh, but we work around the world and the mission is to connect for partners and local communities to the benefit of tourism by developing and supporting community-owned enterprises while promoting more responsible travel. So we work together hand-by-hand uh, -hand with community tourism organizations and um, helping them through different initiatives to uplift their businesses and their communities. The Global Community Tourism Network was launched last year, and it's um, a, a project that Planetera is promoting. And the idea is to support community tourism enterprises to achieve their goals, social and environmental goals, breaking down the barriers that could exist in the tourism marketplace. Uh, it aims to increase capacity, quality, and accessibility of 
community tourism enterprises all over the world. And some of the initiatives that this um, network has is that we're giving access to all these community tourism enterprises to online learning, also the opportunity to connect and network with colleagues all over the world and the opportunity to, for partnership and promotion to through Planetera and our also um, corporate partners. Right now, in, inside the network, we have 425 community tourism enterprises in 70, 70 countries around the world. Okay. And, Part of the Global Community Tourism Network, we have some um, partnerships that are very important to us. One of them is the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance, which was founded to create and support an international network of indigenous individuals and group dedicated to tourism development. WINTA has been uh, one of those partners that is very important since the beginning of the network. And also it's a partner directly to Planet Terra. So we work together in different ways. Winta is also committed to develop and implement the strategies for the advancement of indigenous tourism. And they work within the tourism industry in ways that promote partnership and respect for indigenous wisdom, values, and not knowledge. So it's a very important part of this webinar. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator for the for the panel today. His name is Jean Philippe uh, Lemoine, and he's the agent of Winta in Latin America, and he works um, in ecotourism, sustainable tourism, community-based tourism, and indigenous tourism. So uh, Jean Philippe, please um, feel free to take the the lead in this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Carlota. Um, and thank you to all the panelists and all the people that are connected today. Uh, well, this is a very important webinar because we are going to talk about specific topics uh, about value, indigenous values, earth wisdom, and how indigenous tourism can support community well being. And we have a very interest, uh, interesting panelist today. So can you pass to the next one, Carlota, please? Um, first, uh, next one. First, I'm going to present uh, Ben Sherman. Well, Ben is the chairman and uh, or the president of the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance uh, Leaders Leadership Council. And he's a member of Okalaga Lakota uh, uh, Nation. He's a national leader in American Indian terms development. And, uh, well, he has been part of many uh, organizations. So Ben, thank you to be here today. Welcome to this, uh, to this webinar. And um, well, it, it's a really honor to have you here today. Next one, Carlota, please. Well, uh, also welcome to Sydney Alicac. Um, Mr. Alicac has an extensive experience linked to indigenous development in Guyana. Uh, between 2015 and 2020, uh, he was the Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs. And since 2020, he has been an advisor to the Council of Elders of Guyana. So thank you, Sydney, Mr. Alicac, to be here today. Next one. Uh, well, uh, welcome to Sagi Gili Diaz. Uh, well, Sagi is from Panama. Uh, she's founder and president of the Indigenous Tourism Network of Panama, Red Turi. Uh, she's also founder and director of the platform Burba Travel. And she has an extensive experience in, develop, uh, in developing and promoting tourism products, focused that on indigenous and rural communities in Panama. And the last one, Chief uh, Ian Campbell, welcome, uh, welcome to this webinar, Chief Ian. Well, he's a hereditary chief from the Squamish nation. His ancestral name is 
uh, Shalek or Halek, well, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> well, Chief, uh, then you, you, you can pronounce it better than me. And he's, uh, uh, well, he's part of, um, uh, well, he's also chairman of Governance Council of the Indigenous Partnership Success Showcase. And through his travel, he's he has represented his nation all over the world and his eyes were open to the plight of indigenous people. So as you can see, we have a very interest, interesting panelist today, uh, indigenous uh, people, indigenous leaders that uh, are very, uh, well, they are indigenous leaders that today we're going to talk about indigenous windows, uh, wisdom, indigenous values. So thank you again to be here today. And we are going to start with, um, with Ben Sherman. Ben, you want to uh, please, uh, if you can open this uh, webinar and then we will start with, uh, with two questions. So Ben, the mic is yours. My Lakota name is Mato Apa, which is strikes the bear. Uh, I first acknowledge and express my respect for the original owners of this land called Colorado, where I am speaking to you from. Uh, these are the homelands of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations. We're going to start this webinar with a prayer, but it is not the usual kind of prayer you might expect. It is a short video created by my deceased friend, Curly Bear Wagner from the Blackfeet Nation. This prayer appropriately expresses the theme of this webinar regarding indigenous earth wisdom. So uh, watch and listen. We can't always know why the Creator does some things, but we know the Creator put us here for a special reason. We know the Creator wants us to care for our Mother Earth and the spirits of all the four-legged and the winged ones to keep the spirit of our water clean, the spirits of our plants growing, caring for all creatures above and below ground, and those that live in the water, and offering a prayer for the spirits of what we use. Help us, great creator, so that all people can better understand your beautiful design to be one with the earth and the sky. This is the way of the Blackfeet. This is the way for all living beings to protect your wondrous creation. These are our offerings. These are our prayers that we may live, die, and be born upon this ancient land you created for us in your wisdom and your love. Thank you. Uh, I apologize if uh, you had any uh, technical difficulties with the uh, video. Um, but anyway, uh, let's start with some facts first. And this will give you context for the information you will get from myself and the panel today. Uh, there are about 480 million indigenous people around the world spread across more than 90 countries. They belong to more than 5,000 different indigenous tribes, groups, or societies, and they speak more than 4,000 
languages. Now, although indigenous people comprise only about 6% of the global population and occupy about 20% of the planet's uh, lands, they provide stewardship over 80% uh, of the many kinds of life in this world. They provide stewardship for biodiversity in the, for, over the entire world. Now, many of the uh, biodiversity hotspots are within indigenous territories. Biodiversity hotspots is the common name for locations on the planet where there remains an abundance of life uh, whose existence is threatened by humans one way or another. I'll give you an example of a biodiversity hotspot uh, that would be uh, in Northern Alaska and Canada uh, among a group of people, indigenous people called the Gwich'in. They have had difficulties for many decades now uh, because the uh, oil industry, the oil predators would like to uh, exploit their lands. And these are lands that are especially sacred to the Gwich'in. They are stewards over a large herd of caribou. Uh, you may know them as reindeer, but the uh, porcupine caribou herd uh, migrates through a large part of their territory up there and a calving place <clears throat> where they give birth to the babies is on the coastline. And that is exactly where the oil predators would like to exploit. So uh, the Guichen and their allies have been winning that fight, but the threat is still there. Who knows what might happen in a different kind of government administration. Now, indigenous people worldwide uh, are fighting to save the territories in a similar manner that have been uh, reduced by colonization, aggressive resource extraction, and development. Indigenous cultures and livelihoods are deeply embedded in the land that they struggle to save. And that's what part of you will, you will learn a part of that from the panel today. That uh, indigenous societies have a special relationship with the earth and all living things on it. They carry a uh, deep and profound spiritual connection to Pachamama, Muchimaka, Mother Earth, that gives them the sacred duty to treat the earth with reverence, respect, and reciprocity. They believe this duty comes from the ancient laws of the creator. So let me close by reading you excerpts from the writing of a young indigenous woman named Lila June. This entire continent was extensively sculpted, gardened, and shaped by international indigenous land management techniques to produce prolific abundance for both humans and all life surrounding them. <clears throat> the underlying principles and value systems of these cultures were the driving forces of their success. And we have a sacred duty to care for our homelands. We believe that other life forms are equal to or ab above humans. So I will uh, leave you with the question that we strive to answer in all our uh, indigenous tourism work. How do we communicate this earth wisdom through indigenous wisdom and other means that we have? 
with that, thank you very much. Mitako Yasin. We are all related. Thank you very much, Ben, for your for your words, for your opening. Uh, well, actually, very important, uh, very important information you you have shared with us, and and also uh, key points of view. Well, uh, now let's proceed with with the key questions that we have today for this um, this webinar. We have two key, uh, key questions. And we are going to start with you, Ben. Okay, the question is, what is the importance of indigenous values and the earth wisdom in indigenous tourism development? Okay, when we talk about indigenous tourism development, we're talking about individuals, groups, communities that uh, wish to get into the tourism business. The tourism business is the most lucrative business in the world for the uh, population. And so it stands to reason that indigenous people would want to take part in that industry. And we conduct training in different parts of the world. And one of the, some of the advice that we give to these indigenous people and groups is to play, pay close attention to the values and earth wisdom that they and their groups possess from their ancient times. It is important to uh, adopt a set of values so that you can have guiding principles for how you proceed with your tourism business. Uh, without values, if you're absent of values, uh, you need some help. And earth wisdom is a necessary part of indigenous uh, tourism efforts. Uh, most visitors to indigenous communities um, are looking for, you know, the best last places in the world to visit that offer them uh, unique uh, experiences. And indigenous people can offer those unique experiences by communicating as part of their tours and as part of their hosting uh, the values and earth wisdom that they have had for a long, long time. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for your point of view. And well, now uh, we're going to hear uh, Mr. or, or sorry, Chief Ian Campbell. Chief, uh, please, the, the microphone is yours. Fantastic. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. Yuan Hotlin Squalwin, Eyal Winoxwit, Tansakwetos. Greetings to my dear respected relatives. Uh, it's so nice to connect with each of you, our family from Winta, our family from Planetera. Thank you for the invitation to join you today. Uh, I am here in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, in the western part of Canada on the Pacific Ocean. Uh, in my home, in our, our community where I was born and raised, the Squamish Nation. And uh, this question is very important around our values and our earth wisdom and how this uh, benefits the tourism uh, development. Uh, in many ways, uh, the revitalization of our language and our culture and our connection to our lands uh, was interrupted with colonialism and there was a deliberate attempt to eradicate our entire way of life. But because of the strength of our elders, we managed to persevere uh, through resilience to maintain our distinct identity and our own laws, our own ways of knowing. And this is really important in a global context to recognize the contributions that indigenous peoples make to the quality of life of settlers who have moved into our homelands. I think that's very important because uh, my parents were denied the opportunity to own land or to go to university or to hire lawyers to be able to protect our interests. But today is a new era where we are now looking at reconciliation with governments that have imposed Western management within our territories. So this collaboration that we're seeing is allowing our young people 
to be safe, to be able to express the traditional knowledge and apply it in a modern context through art, through song, through dance, through regalia, and by welcoming people to our homelands, this is an important way to show the world that we are not a vanished race. Many countries that I've traveled to, I tell them I'm indigenous, I'm native. Uh, they look at me blink, blink, and it's not until I do the like this, and then they say, ah, you're Indian. So the world has a, a view of who we are, but it's now our opportunity to dispel any preconceived images that people have and to showcase the strength of our cultures. When we share our stories uh, with people that come, whether they're local or if they're visitors, it allows them to open their minds and their hearts to see the beauty of this part of the world, wherever your territories are. And I find that storytelling is an amazing way to celebrate uh, our collective journey. So it moves beyond us and them to create a, a space where it is us. And I think that's where the values and the earth wisdom uh, will really benefit this next iteration of tradition for our peoples, which will move into indigenous tourism. That will empower the voice of our people. It will honor our elders and it'll uh, honor the next generation to then engage in business opportunities that meet our values, our principles, our epistemologies as indigenous peoples. And it celebrates that we are not alone in the, in the world, but there's many, just as our good friend Ben uh, indicated, there are many people doing this together as we move forward. Uh, it is that unity as indigenous peoples that we can continue to celebrate. So that is my uh, my thoughts today on, on this topic of the uh, values of earth wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Campbell. Um, well, we will continue with Mr. Alikak from Guyana. Mr. Alikak, please. Love you. Oh, yeah, now, now we can hear you. Thank you so very much. And Myanmar uh, from this part of the world, which is known as Guyana. I must begin by thanking Planetera and, and uh, the next one. Winter for making this possible for me to be part of this most wonderful concept of the engagement contribution of the indigenous peoples of the world. I would first of all like to say it is indeed a great opportunity to share our thoughts, take action and make our contribution in this new direction of an old pathway. I would like to give support to the speakers before me. Um, it is the same trend of thought that we have across the world. So when I hear you, from Canada, from America, from Australia, or whichever part of the world, speaking as an indigenous person, I could relate. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Now we get to the question and how we, we move forward. I believe, well, for us, we think, first of all, of who we are or what we are. And we see that indigenous to the various areas that we belong. And that is why I think first and foremost, we must love ourselves. And then 
we cherish what we have so that we could be able to communicate with our relations and share those ideas. And what we have is life. Even though we are known to poor, we have life. And as long as we have life, we could share the wisdom with our relations across the globe and get comfort from it. Number two, we always believe that there are three important pillars of life. And those would be fresh water, pure air, and sunshine. These are values that we as indigenous peoples do have. And we could, and this is what others would like to experience. We also have a very, very good idea of how the flora and fauna operates and how we, as one of the beings of life, contribute to management and protection of Mother Nature so that Mother Nature could continue to protect us. I believe personally, and we have been talking about this in Guyana, more so at my home in Surama, about the values that we have. We have many moons protected our homeland. And it is because we understand those values. We interact. And we know and follow the legacy of our elders who have gone before us. And those legacies were left by stories being told continuously from generation to generation so that we could always understand the value of the laws of nature that the great creator has in place for us to have that knowledge to manage our beautiful environment. Of recent, well, when I say recent, um, or really recent, we have found oil in Guyana that's like in 19, sorry, 2015. And we have found this in abundance. And we also recognize that oil has been a problem across the oil rich countries. We're that the indigenous peoples here are very vulnerable to whatever development might take place through the riches of oil, would we benefit? That is a big question. We also have embarked upon economic development through tourism. And it was good to hear Ben in his presentation saying that it is tourism is one of the greatest business in the world today. What we have been trying to do is understanding that we have the goods or what we would 
call, we have the activities. But we have persons who are interested in visiting, who has the means of financial support. And this could give us a partnership in business with respect. We own the business, but the customers support our business. And I think having that approach, we would be able to have a better respectful understanding of how we do business. Uh, we, we do not destroy the environment to achieve uh, that economic growth. Rather, we try to support one another and share the knowledge and encourage customers to come visit us. And we use the means of photography. And we know that some areas do like photography, but we have found that as one of the cheapest way of promoting our businesses. We ask the customer to help us to send the pictures to other friends, relatives, so that they could come to visit us. And we try as much as possible to educate the customer on the values of modern nature and the values of knowledge of the indigenous peoples, the wisdom and the love for mother earth. In this way, we believe that we could bring happiness into the minds of many, many customers who might have never seen a pristine forest or have a wilderness that they could go and reconnect to mother nature. And I believe, as a matter of fact, that I believe that our people are on the right track. As, as the saying goes, old pathways with new directions. And now that we have this webinar in action, I think it is well positioned for us to take the next, uh, great steps of bringing happiness to, well, to first of all, allowing the indigenous tourism development to bring happiness to customers and to, and to Philippi, thanks so much for offering me this opportunity. I hope this makes contribution to the question that you asked. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ralikak, for your, for your words. And well, we are going to finish um, this question, this first question with the participation of Sagi from Panama. Well, Sagi is representing today an indigenous woman. So, uh, and we are going to switch to Spanish because she's going to uh, answer uh, in Spanish. Bienvenida Sogi, eh, gracias por estar aquí representando el día de hoy a, a la mujer indígena desde Panamá. Así que Sogi, si puedes responder a, a la pregunta. Voy a decir algo en mi, en mi idioma natal. Bequite Buenatcan, no hagan mi mala. Hola hermanos del mundo, ¿cómo están? Espero que se encuentren bien. Sí, estoy muy feliz de estar aquí con ustedes compartiendo este día. Y primero también quiero agradecerle a Winta y a Planeterra por la invitación. Definitivamente muy agradecida por este espacio. Quiero compartir con ustedes que recuerdo que mi abuelo, un inadule, que significa médico botánico, era una persona muy reconocida a nivel de la comarca. 
Y también recuerdo que cuando una vez fui al bosque con un médico botánico, como iba en el camino con una ceremonia hablándole a la naturaleza, a las plantas, antes de tomarla. Eso nos mostraba el respeto y el amor y la comunión, la comunicación que había entre estos seres. Nosotros los jóvenes, hablo en general, debemos de respetar a la madre naturaleza, que es la buena en mi lengua materna. Como pueblos originarios, tenemos mucho que ofrecer. Nuestra riqueza cultural, nuestro patrimonio, nuestras tradiciones, nuestras costumbres, nuestras ceremonias, lo que practicamos en nuestras casas grandes, en las comunidades. El turismo es muy importante, lo debemos de ver como una herramienta que nosotros debemos de apoyarnos, respetando a las comunidades indígenas, visitándolo de manera responsable, haciendo conciencia del respeto y el amor que hay hacia la naturaleza y hacia lo que somos. Muy importante todo lo que dijeron los panelistas. Nosotros primero debemos de amarnos, de respetarnos, para que otros nos puedan respetar. Se dice, la UNESCO tiene un informe donde indica que cada dos semanas se pierde una lengua materna. Eso es parte de nuestra riqueza cultural. ¿Cómo nosotros debemos de cuidarlo y mantenerlo? Entonces, pienso que a través del turismo, nosotros como pueblos también revaloramos lo que somos. Pero no queremos que el turismo llegue a nuestras comunidades sino que hagamos conciencia internamente de lo que somos, de nuestra fortaleza, de lo orgulloso que debemos de estar de pueblos originarios. Que todo este tiempo hemos sido los, los que hemos guardado y cuidado la naturaleza. Es por ello que yo quiero invitar a todas las personas aquí presentes, a los que tienen sus hijos, que los inviten, que se sientan orgullosos y que fomenten ese amor a nuestra cultura indígena. Nos mucho que ofrecer definitivamente totalmente estoy de acuerdo en el rincón donde estemos de repente muchos de los que estamos presentes no estamos en nuestras comarcas no estamos dentro de nuestros territorios pero podemos hacer la diferencia también haciendo pequeños aportes haciendo una muestra de lo orgulloso de lo que somos siendo esa conexión que necesitan los niños y los jóvenes hoy en día así es que Definitivamente, yo considero que el reconocimiento de nosotros mismos, de lo que somos, de nuestras raíces, es de suma importancia. Y también quiero recordar a los mártires de 1925 de la Revolución Dule, que gracias a estos héroes de mi comarca, hoy puedo portar con orgullo mi mola, la vestimenta tradicional, que para nosotros es un símbolo de lucha y de resistencia y también que representa a las mujeres de la comarca Cuna. Definitivamente me siento muy orgullosa de seguir portándola, de seguir danzando y poder seguir compartiendo con mis conocidos, con mis familias, con todas las personas en Panamá de lo que quieran aprender sobre mi riqueza cultural. Pero hagámoslo con respeto. Respetémonos para que otros nos respeten. De esa manera, nosotros yo creo, yo creo y considero que podemos fortalecernos cada día más. Y también a los niños, los jóvenes, que creo que son los más vulnerables. A ellos son los que tenemos nosotros que capacitar y nosotros también motivarlos a que continúen fortaleciendo el conocimiento de los saberes de nuestras abuelas y nuestros abuelos. Quiero recordar las palabras de mi madre, que cada vez que hablamos del tema del amor, de la transmisión de generación a generación, en cuna, voy a decirlo en cuna y después lo traduzco al español. Amarigui, saer, gebe, amargar, burba, o ganguega, dice mi madre, muy preocupada. Me dice, ¿qué podemos hacer nosotros para seguir fortaleciendo nuestro espíritu, nuestros huesos, literalmente, ¿no? nuestro espíritu de lo que somos, para que no se pierda, para que continúe de generación en generación? Creo que las personas que estamos aquí presentes tenemos un gran reto, una gran tarea. Es de mantener y continuar viva con nuestras tradiciones y costumbres y de que no se pierdan. Muchas gracias.
Muchas gracias, eh, Sogi, por eh, tremenda visión que tienes y, y por compartir esa sabiduría de tu pueblo. Thank you very much, Sogi, uh, sharing uh, that uh, the, your, your people are indigenous uh, knowledge. So uh, we are going to pass to the second question. So we are going to start with uh, Mr. Alikak. Okay, this is the second question. How does indigenous tourism support the community well-being? Well, it's a big question. I, we could be talking about it during a long time, but well, we just have uh, around 15 minutes for, for all the panelists. So Mr. Radikak, go ahead. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's a, a huge question here. However, first of all, it is ownership. And like we said, we have to love ourselves first. It is own the business because we know what we have. We know the flora and fauna. We know the value. We know where they are. And for us, fortunately for us in Guyana, we own land. We, we have our village lands, which is not the, the traditional lands, but uh, well, fully traditional, but we own lands and we have, we still have pristine forests within our lands. And uh, it is to have, for, for my um, uh, community, we do not have uh, many um, precious stones or uh, things of that sort, but what we have is forest, we have savanna land, and we have both a unique area with savanna lands and uh, forested areas that has different to its own area, the different species of plants, animals, birds, and uh, fishes, reptiles, and insects. So we know these and our approach is to have persons trained in the various areas using the common knowledge uh, to identify those species and have persons responsible for the various areas which will lead on to things like catering, uh, transport, um, uh, and other activities, health, education, but we own, we own those things so that every individual will have their responsibility which they would be compensated for when the customers come. So, the, the biggest thing is have ownership and this will be able to bring that happiness to our people. But the other activity that we have is that persons are given the opportunity to work when they, when they are available. So we have a rotational system. Uh, sometimes you work for two months, three months, or a month on, month off. So you have time for your traditional way of life. You have time for visitation. You have time for community work and that sort of a thing. So it brings the council in full operation. They are fully responsible for the management of their community. And so the tourism business is the business of our community. They own it. And the managers, and so they manage the, the business so that we get um, total benefit from our activities. 
We also encourage um, part-time partnership and we allow it to, to grow like we would probably sign a one, a one year agreement. And if it, if it works well, then we continue or if we need to ratify it, then we do so. But we feel that um, we have to have the knowledge of international tourism, the, the knowledge of how other people operate from various countries, and we share ours with them so that we have a good experience at the end of their journey. So I think it's workable, but we need this webinar to I, I think we need to use this webinar to see other examples that might have been working, say, in Canada, in Central America, and America, so that use the best practices that is uh, in connection with the understanding of the laws of modern nature. So that is what I would share now until we get another 15 minutes sometime later. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Alikak. No worries. Uh, I received the information that we have a couple of minutes more. So the important here is to share. Uh, we, 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 we are here today to, to listen to you, your knowledge, your vision about uh, indigenous tourism from this uh, indigenous wind wisdom and connection with, with Mother Earth uh, point of view. So uh, thank you again, Mr. Alikak. So we are going to go with uh, Mrs. Sogigili Diaz. Uh, so we are going to switch into Spanish again. Sogi, uh, bueno, ahora te toca responder a la segunda pregunta. Adelante. Muchas gracias de nuevo. Sí, eh, para, los, para nosotros los pueblos originarios debemos considero que para practicar un turismo indígena tiene que ser definitivamente administrado por los pueblos indígenas, por sus comunidades, ¿no? por sus líderes. Entonces, dicho esto, para que sea una economía solidaria, de que todos sean beneficiarios, ¿no? y también este, que sea sostenible. Es muy importante también por eso que cada día nos capacitemos ¿no? como comunidades, pero de esa manera también saber cómo poder recibir a nuestros visitantes y que se lleven una experiencia auténtica. Porque nosotros, como pueblos, si sabemos, somos los, los, que, los que cuidamos la naturaleza. Y por ello, cada vez, cada entorno que se visita, se deja un wow. ¿no? Cada persona que llega a nuestras comunidades llega con expectativas, pero creo que sobrepasamos las expectativas porque no solamente encuentra un lugar maravilloso, un lugar donde se pueda conectar con la naturaleza, sino también su gente, su pueblo, su riqueza cultural. Entonces, tenemos muchas cosas que ofrecer, sus hermosas playas, sus, hermos, sus bosques exuberantes, nuestra gastronomía, tenemos tanto potencial, solo que hay que hacerlo también de manera consciente. Nosotros, como comunidades de pueblos indígenas, también tenemos que prepararnos ante esas exigencias, esas demandas, con respeto y amor a lo que tenemos, a lo que cada día nos hace más importante. Porque si bien es cierto, la pandemia, la pandemia este, nos ha hecho ver a muchas personas de diferentes partes del mundo que, que ahora es importante conectarse con la naturaleza. Nosotros eso no lo sabíamos, ya lo conocíamos. Nosotros hemos crecido con ese respeto a la, a la madre naturaleza. Pero qué bueno que a veces pasan cosas eh, a nivel mundial para que las personas se den cuenta, ¿no? Creo que esta es una gran oportunidad entonces de nosotros también verlo de manera positiva, de ver cómo nosotros como pueblos originarios también podemos mejorar nuestros servicios y productos, hablando de este modo, ¿no? Este, a nivel de, de turismo, que pienso que tenemos muchas, muchas riquezas que podamos ofrecer. Así es que, pero claro, sí, basándonos en nuestra riqueza cultural que creo que es lo más importante e ir rescatando lo que consideramos como cada pueblo de lo que nos encontramos aquí, qué es lo que hemos ido perdiendo con el tiempo, 
y cómo podemos hacer para poder ir rescatándolo. Porque, la, porque el turismo, claro que está, que nos trae muchos beneficios. Agarrémonos de ese beneficio. De que si el turista siente que, que es interesante nuestro idioma y quiere aprender, entonces nosotros sentirnos más orgullosos y decir, ¿saben qué? Vamos a aprender cada día más de nuestra lengua materna. Y que nuestros hijos también lo aprendan. Que no se pierda. De esa manera nos vamos a fortalecer y poder ofrecer. Porque sin riqueza cultural, sino poder ofrecer lo que somos, ¿de qué sirve ofrecer un turismo? ¿De qué nos sirve? Si nuestro atractivo es lo que somos, lo que podamos compartir como personas, como pueblos originarios. Entonces creo que es manera de, de compartir con ustedes que hagamos conciencia y que nos valoremos de lo que somos y podamos mostrarle al mundo todo lo que tenemos como pueblos y todo nuestro entorno. Porque definitivamente que estoy segura que todos los rincones de los que, de los que estamos aquí presentes en estos momentos, cada lugar es maravilloso y auténtico. Muchas gracias, Sogi, por tu punto de vista. Thank you very much, Sogi, for your point of view. So uh, we will continue with uh, Chief uh, Ian, Ian Campbell. Please, Chief. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's very exciting to see all of the chat that everybody is identifying where you are in the world. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to meet everybody and to have this discussion. Uh, I think there are many tangible ways that uh, tourism supports our community. Um, you know, I've worked in the last 22 years for my tribe in creating space for our young people to flourish. And it's really based on uh, our mentors, our elders who are now passed on, who embedded a deep sense of stewardship and responsibilities to us. Uh, so we have to take the information that our elders shared and apply it through innovation, through new and exciting ways that stimulate our young people, that inspire them to be a part of the growth of our, of our people. Uh, you know, I worked on, for example, simple highway that goes up through our territories. Uh, when the government wanted to build this highway, we said, no, you can't just build a highway because this is going to bring many more people into our lands, uh, privatizing real estate, driving values up, uh, more users in the backcountry. So we argued and we said, if you're going to build this road, we want to be partners and we want environmental protection, and we want visible presence. So we put all of the signs along the road in our language. It's not French and it's not English, therefore it must be indigenous. This allowed us to create a visible presence to showcase that we're not a vanished race. We then built a cultural center in Whistler at the end of the highway, uh, which is a, a ski hill destination. And we said, we need to be a part of this ski hill destination. The tourism brings billions of dollars through our territories. And for many years, we benefited zero. So we said, we're going to build a cultural center and we're going to uh, have presence. And then we're going to empower our young people to take our stories and apply them in new and exciting ways. So we developed ambassador programs. We also did our land use planning. Uh, which was sort of that 30,000 foot level looking at our lands and territories and doing an inventory of how much uh, has been impacted by forestry, by hydro, by, by development. And we then protected about 8% of our territory representing 50,000 hectares. This allowed us to then bring our young people into those beautiful parts of old growth forest into our mountains and our rivers where we have beautiful animals. And we immersed our young people in our traditions through rites of passage, cleansing ceremonies. But we also then paired them with universities to build our traditional knowledge with Western knowledge and bring them together so that our people can then engage in tourism and hospitality by welcoming people to our lands. Uh, you know, we then hosted the 2010 Winter Olympics, which we did the opening ceremonies in, in 2010 and showed the world that there are many indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, you know, so this then led to an era of reconciliation between indigenous peoples and Canadians to then discuss the impacts of colonialism. All of this then allows safety 
for our young people to then take this knowledge and utilize it in new and exciting ways. So, uh, you know, I'm now entering into a chopper business, a helicopter business to bring visitors into very remote parts of our territory where we want our young people to be the interpreters, where they're gonna share the stories, do the setup, do the cleanup, the cooking, and give them that experience to be professional, to then uh, present themselves to an international audience and create an experience that's not just uh, physical, but it's also spiritual. By bringing people to our lands, they're seeing it through our eyes, through our lens, through that of our ancestors, but it also creates space for future opportunities for our young people. So when I was a negotiator for my tribe, we always asked the fundamental question, why are we doing this if there is not a path for young people to be successful and to flourish? So I think revitalization of language and culture is a very important benefit that comes from tourism. Uh, you know, the storytelling, the innovation, uh, the sacred spaces that we honor, uh, not as Western management, but as indigenous uh, laws, uh, the pride and identity, and the stories of triumph that we've overcome many challenges uh, over the thousands of years of our existence in our lands. Uh, we've experienced many times of flourishing and a near decimation, flourishing, near decimation. And today we're now recovering from a pandemic and we're now welcoming people to come back to our lands and to see the beauty of our lands and our animals and our waters and our people uh, through our lens. So I think our epistemology uh, has stood the test of time. I think that there are many ways that uh, tourism uh, supports our community for the economy, but also the, the revitalization of our identity and the celebration that it's no longer illegal in Canada to be an Indigenous person, to practice our culture in which it was illegal for my parents and grandparents up until around 1951, it was illegal for us to practice our culture. Hmm. So times have changed and it's up to us. It's our responsibility to make it better for our future generations. So I think there are many tangible benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, well, I, very interesting your point of view uh, about revitalization, isn't it? Uh, the, the, that mean uh, tourism is a tool to be used by indigenous people. So thank you. Well, we are going to, to finish this uh, second question with uh, Ben, the president of WINTA, Ben Sherman. Ben, go ahead. Oh, ben, you're, you're mute. Okay, thank you, John Philippe. Um, let me make this very short, and I want to relate to you a story, well, many stories that we've heard in our travels, because uh, we always get into the question of why do you want to do tourism? And in the mainstream tourism throughout the world, they want to make as much money as possible. But if you go into an indigenous community, most of the discussion is about culture, environment, history. And to me, that is very pleasing. They, they put a higher priority on restoring and rebuilding and communicating their, their, their cultural values and the environmental needs. Uh, so, it's surprising that, uh, of course, they want uh, the economic benefits. They must have them, but they would devote equal time to putting together the rest of the program based on culture and environment. I think I'll end right there, uh, Jean-Philippe. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. Uh, before continuing with, uh, with questions from, from the audience. I would like to, to make a, a short conclusion about every single question. Well, for the first question, the first question, uh, the first question was, what is the importance of indigenous values and the earth wisdom in indigenous tourism development? Uh, well, you talk about the values are 
key for the development of indigenous tourism from the cultural traditions. Uh, it's important to recognize the contribution of indigenous people. I mean, the culture, uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, the Chief Campbell said reconciliation. He, he talked about this. Um, the importance of the empowerment of indigenous people to use tourism as a tool. Um, Mr. Ali Cox said, it's important to share what we have, life, uh, the knowledge, the indigenous knowledge. And he talked about, uh, Mr. Ali Cox talked about the, in, the environmental indigenous knowledge to share, to share it with visitors. And Sagi uh, said um, the importance of passing to young people the culture to teach uh, to teach young about the culture and to use tourism as a tool. And for the second question, which was. One second, please. Which was how does indigenous tourism support the community well-being? Well, uh, Mr. Alicac said that. Uh, uh, well, he he talked about indigenous uh, environmental knowledge again, but he highlighted the ownership that the business must be led by the indigenous people. So tourism must be led by the indigenous people. And I say it again, because this is, this is one of the definition of indigenous tourism, led by indigenous people and, um, uh, and uh, then the experiences must be connected with their culture. And Sagi, uh, Sagi also, said uh, that the ownership is very important, but she also said solidarity, solidarity among the community. And Chief uh, Campbell said that uh, tourism is important because it can be used as a tool to, to revitalize the culture, uh, to share, information that was um, uh, cultivated, we can say, by uh, and, and shared by elders. Elders that today are not here, so they have that, that information, that is specific information that belongs to, to their culture and, and they can use tourism to share it to the, with the world. And Ben, uh, finish it, this second question saying that he's impressed that when uh, when he asked to or, or someone asked to indigenous people why they are working in tourism, most of them don't talk just about the importance of the of income, you know, because it's a it, it's an activity that produces income. But most of indigenous people said that the uh, uh, tourism helped them to, to revitalize the culture, to protect the environment, to share history, uh, to restore um, the biodiversity among others. So, well, this is a very short conclusion about every single question. So thank you very much uh, to the panelists today. Actually, it's an honor to me to be here today, to be the moderator of, of this incredible webinar. And well, Carlota, uh, I, uh, we go with you now. So probably there are a couple of questions from the audience. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. I'm like, I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. It's been such an honor to have you all here sharing all those beautiful, words um i don't think there are any questions i was looking at the chat in the q a there aren't 
I know there is a couple, a lot of comments of thanking the panelists for the beautiful words, for being part of this movement of transformation, for the inspire, for this inspiring session. Este, um, let me see what else. There's a for yeah. Thank you for the beautiful contributions. Very important points and. Ah, bueno, there's a question for Gilber from Gilberto. He's from Panama. Um, what does it mean an autochthonous sustainable tourism? If you can, if one of you can clarify. Okay, now the questions are coming. Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to take the lead responding this question. It's basically what is what does it mean sustainable, like an autochthonous sus sustainable tourism? I, I can take that, Carlotta. Please, uh, Ben, thank you. The, the word sustainable is being kicked around for years and years now in all kinds of different ways. And originally, it meant to sustain the conditions under which they originally existed or exist today. Well, that's not good enough because there has been too much damage and destruction that is caused by the tourism industry. So we don't want to sustain that condition. We actually want to improve that condition. But we have other buzzwords in the industry, such as uh, regenerative, which is actually a better term than sustainable, uh, regenerating the uh, environment, the earth and the cultures. And but the earliest one was ecotourism. And that was kind of an utter failure because it was taken advantage by too many tour operations. And they conducted what we call greenwashing by advertising themselves as ecotourism enterprises, when in fact, they were anywhere near that. So uh, I don't like to use the term sustainable. I would, I would rather use terms that are familiar to the indigenous community for how they want to uh, present themselves and perhaps uh, improve their environment and restore their cultures and gain more independence and sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, for this answer. I think the question has been more than answered with your words. And um, I have another question here, and is how can non-Indigenous friends best help Indigenous communities? Because I believe your values are what we need to survive and flourish. Very good question. I think Ian Campbell wants to answer. Please go ahead. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Thank you. First of all, I want to say hi to Anna. Uh, we we love you and miss you from, from Vancouver, your family here in the Squamish Nation. Uh, I really appreciate your question. And, and I really believe in collaboration. Um, you know, we're new entrants in the market when it comes to investment and capacity uh, and how to package our culture and apply it through innovation uh, in articulating it in new and exciting ways. So I believe partnerships are important. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm doing a partnership with a, a helicopter company to then bring tourism uh, into our territory. Uh, you know, we're, we can't do it alone. If, if you look at my tribe, we're 4,000 people and the talent pool within 4,000 people, so many of them are interested in tourism, not everybody. So those that are interested, they need support, they need investment, they need uh, you know, the right tools available to them. And it's really around partnerships that I'm seeing uh, a lot of the narrative change in Canada. And tourism is across, uh, sorry, investment and partnerships are across many sectors, but it also leads to tourism. So if we hold a conference, we have packages where people can come and do kayaking or canoeing or hiking or, or talking trees tours. There's all of these products that people want to come ahead of time and experience before they go into conferences or before they do anything else. 
So this then allows caterers and, and all sorts of other people to then be involved in the stimulus of the economy. So I, I believe that there's a value chain that's associated with tourism uh, that includes you know, merchandise and all sorts of other areas that allow people to then um, you know, flourish and, and be profitable and to also not then um, uh, or to, to adhere to our values, which you talked uh, about in your question. So collaboration is, is the key in my opinion. Thank you. Collaboration it is. <laughs> Let's see, I have a, a very important, I think a very important question here from Sandro Saravia. Um, he's saying that some of the ancestral vision and knowledge um, of the indigenous people have been taken as with a lot of romantic sensitivity. Um, and then to go inside and strengthen the identity and pride. But how is it possible to go beyond that and support progress and development? Who would like to jump in and respond to this question? I, I, if, I, if I may then, um, I, I appreciate the question and I, I agree that there is a lot of romanticizing of our culture. Uh, even Canadians, you know, 20 years ago, didn't know whose territory they're in. So the narrative is slowly, incrementally changing as we move to reconciliation. It's an opportunity to then not only talk about, uh, you know, the culture and the values, but also get to the truth of the impacts of murdered missing Indigenous women, of, you know, truth and reconciliation, uh, the calls to action, United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, have all been tools that have brought to the focus the reality that Indigenous peoples face within our own homelands, the violence uh, perpetuated through systemic racism, through policing, uh, through every institute that's Western that is really uh, against Indigenous peoples, uh, our own laws. So it's up to us politically to continue to push and to pull and to, to affect change to create safety. And that then allows us to tell our own story. Why I cited the 2010 Winter Olympics and the opening ceremonies was because the producers and directors wanted to show us in a certain way, the Pocahontas, the kind of romanticized version of indigenous peoples. And we said, absolutely not. So we had to take a stand and demand that if we're gonna showcase to the world that we're still here, we're gonna do it according to our values and our regalia, our traditions. And that inspired many other Indigenous peoples in many different countries who then reached out and said, we want to build from that and continue to incrementally bring back uh, you know, our ways of knowing and share it with the world. Uh, so I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I, I, I'm sure that helps. Um, there's also you know, a comment on a question from, from Natalia, from, she's representing the indigenous population in Costa Rica, the Briwiri from the South Caribbean. And she's saying that they've been working with tourism for about 30 years, and that has helped a lot um, to strengthen their, their culture, their cosmovision, um, and the importance of, of Mother Earth, as it is called in Briwiri, Iridia. Um, but there's also been a lot of challenges and, and, and the tourism has helped to go beyond those challenges because there's been political action and visibility. But then she's also saying that the indigenous people in Costa Rica have been menaced and um, they've been some, um, some people have been killed because there's st strong leaders of these cultures and how to how to go beyond this this challenge that could uh, put in risk the the touristic activities and of course the the communities that are living 
out of it and the people in general in these communities. Yeah, the land is also being taken care of from them, taken from them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think with this question, we can start closing. This is the last one. Well, that was uh, such a long question. I, I didn't really get <laughs> the specific. See, well, uh, the, the sp specific question is that um, in Costa Rica, in, this, in some of the indigenous um, communities and land has been taken from them and some main leaders have been killed um, because of the political movement they're making and how can that put in risk the tourism activity they are offering um so how to how to go beyond this this challenge of facing a uh, land being taken away from them and also killing some of our leaders well <laughs> winter uh, gets very involved in indigenous human rights and of course, killing an indigenous, indigenous person is certainly a violation of their rights. But uh, we find that in the uh, tourism business for indigenous people, uh, the denial of those rights mainly is about uh, failure to access uh, opportunities in their country, in their region. And so uh, since the tourism is a legitimate business, uh, you rarely see opportunities for violence when people are asserting their independence to create a business. And uh, when we worked in Chile, for example, uh, we spent some time talking to government people and, and the government people uh, worked with the indigenous people on the development through a number of years to the point where the indigenous community is organized across the entire country and fairly well independent, or as uh, Mr. Alicott says, they own their work. So uh, that's about all I want to say. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of activism going on around us, but in the tourism industry, we generally don't get involved in the violent activism. Thank you, Ben. Okay, um, I think that was the last question. Um, so we can start closing this webinar. I, again, appreciate the presence of Winta um, on, be, on behalf of uh, Planetera and all our team. Uh, we appreciate all of the panelists that are here today. Uh, sharing all your wisdom and all your knowledge about this specific topic. I cannot find a better way of commemorating this, this, this day, Rada, the, the day of the uh, world, International Day of the World's Indigenous People than with, with this webinar where you're here, Rada, owning it and, and telling the world what, what we need to know about your, your um, your people, your your communities. I don't know if Jean Philippe, you want to see a, say some closing words, or Ben. <laughs> well, I will start very short. Huh? Uh, thank you very much to to everyone. Uh, well, to the panelists, to to Planetera team, uh, Planetera's team, and uh, to all the participants. Uh, well, greetings from Chile. And I can see that many of the participants are from, uh, well, our, our partners, we know most of them. So I'm happy to see them here today because we are a huge community now. And the tourism is growing everywhere in the world. So that's very positive. So thank you very much again. Ben, I don't know if you want to say the, a couple of last uh, words. Well, I, I think uh, we owe a big thanks to Planetera from Winta. Uh, you are a good partner and we enjoyed this. 
I might say that this same kind of theme about indigenous earth wisdom uh, is going to continue to be a campaign of winter. And uh, we're having a, the winter summit in Perth, Australia in March of next year, where we will again address this topic very deeply. And uh, I, I, Ian Campbell, Chief Campbell will be there as well to again express his thoughts. Uh, and of course, John Philippe will be there and anybody else who can make it to Perth, Australia. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, all the participants, all the panelists, Winta, and on behalf of Planetera, a big thank you. And yes, please um, continue to follow what the work of, of Winta and the work of Planetera. And yes, thank you so much. I hope you all have a great, um, I think it's all sorts of people from all over the world. So maybe a, good, a great day, a great night, a great everything. Um, thank you so much. Thank we'll you. see you in the next one. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs>